is um, in a day like today, which is uh, six hours of face-to-face -face time setting you off for the summertime of work for you get to, to, to get to do this work. This is probably, I think, um, the sixth cohort that I've personally launched over the last seven years. And so um, in my own reflection of like being a facilitator of group work over a summertime, helping people imagine an idea and then actually paying them and supporting them over the summer to develop that idea, I've learned a few things along the way that seem to help and work. So one of the things that I have learned along the way is if at the beginning, if you can clear the deck of the old school year and think forward to the summer work that you get to do now. This is at your own leisure. This is like the best parts of your profession, right? Like this is the reason why you got involved is because you get to dive deep into your own practice and think about what am I going to do over the summertime? What do I want to accomplish uh, with a little bit of time that the district is giving to me and then other time that I will volunteer because I love what I do, right? And so really that's what this session is about. And we're going to hit at some point, we're going to cover some tech basics, some things to make sure everybody has an uh, equal playing field or at least has access to those things on the playing field, so if you need them. So later on, I'm going to tell you how to set up your YouTube channel. Most of you might already have your YouTube channel set up. Awesome. We'll fly through that really fast. I'll show you something else I love about YouTube. Uh, so we're going to have little mini sessions like that throughout the day, and then really we're going to come back to this idea of your plan over and over again to try to come to um, uh, an idea a visualization of what you want to get done over the summer so that you create the time to get it done over the summer. I've also had the, the great opportunity to work on a lot of things um, that I enjoy around education and technology, doing consulting work outside of Robbinsdale. I've had the free time to develop my own passions, and I know like, it still is required because I love these things, because I love what I do, and I love thinking about how technology can help me reach more children and how it can make learning richer and deeper, I believe these things. I still have experienced that I have to carve out time. I have to give myself permission to go and do that investigation myself. So that's the other thing that you're going to have to do over the summer. So I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes about the nature of our work and what I've explored over the last um, number of years in getting started with this technology integration thing, but really this, you know, this primary education thing. So boop. Uh, so at some point, really for all of us, um, we're in this range of about 80% of our lives collectively have been spent in and around school desks and thinking about school, right? And so like 80% of our own existence has either been attending or providing education for other people for the vast majority of our life, which is like, it's kind of cool. Uh, and so in that own reflection, like, all right, so what have I learned in that 80% of the time? What have we learned uh, and how um, can we apply what we've learned to get to these lofty ideas of teaching all children? One of the reasons why I'm such a big fan of public schools is because of the concept of all. We aspire to reach all children, that's a pretty um, aspirational goal. It's a pretty amazing goal and you know I dig it. Uh, and so what are some of the things that we can do with the new tools that are available? And so here's this little thing is about alright so 80% of our time has been spent doing this. What are some reflections that I've picked up along the way? Some that um, may agree with some things that you've experienced and some that may challenge it. I don't know. Uh, Alright next slide. Yeah, that's my own little resume you know uh, there's some benefit to having bounced around. There's some unease at times, like, oh, are they going to ask me back? I don't know. Like, and then there's some benefit to having bounced around the metro area a little bit in these um, four different school districts is I get to see some broad themes, like things that we experience acutely. This, is, this kid is the only kid that's ever done that with a cell phone before, I can tell you. Actually, I've experienced seven different high schools, and that kid is at every single high school, right? Like, a lot of these problems that we're experiencing that feel like they're unique to our situation are actually shared problems, and that's one of the amazing things about technology is we can come up with shared solutions to these problems. So uh, that's why that's there. Next slide. Um, one of the themes that I've picked up on over the last number of years is this idea of learning um, that has been liberated. And again, as an education professional, someone who's dedicated my life to thinking about learning and how other people learn and do that, I've realized more and more that the institution of learning is becoming less and less important. Like, we can't just say we're the game in town. We're public schools. That makes us awesome. 
come to us because you have very little choices. There are a lot of other choices now. Learning has been liberated. Kids can learn about things that they care about in ways that just didn't exist before. And they can care about really weird things, right? Like making fidget spinners do tricks. Like that's a weird thing to care about, but geez, they'll dive in and learn about it. And so learning has been liberated is one of the key things for me that makes me question, why do I want to put extra effort into continuing to update my practice and think about what I do? It's because I'm not the only game in town anymore. This picture right there, that's my wife sitting there, and that's my daughter, Emily, in the corner. And uh, just for example, this is a free space in Lowry. Anyone can check out this space. It's uh, Uptown Plumbing and Heating. They have Wi-Fi in it. Ooh, it's pretty cool. I mean, actually, it's pretty amazing. Uh, and this group of people right here, we did a mystery Skype, which is where you connect with another classroom from somewhere around the world, and you ask yes or no questions and try to figure out where they are. That classroom right there is in Myanmar. And we did that all for free through a Twitter chat that set up the thing. And so this is a group of teachers talking to another group of teachers in Myanmar, people that never, never would have had the chance to meet 12 years ago. 12 years ago, right? Uh, talking about, what are you guys doing in education? They wanted to know about standards. We were like, it's no, we don't want to talk about standards. We want to talk about kids and things we care about. But they were um, very sweet and precious. So um, that, to me, is one of those amazing things. All right, next slide. <clears throat> Uh, breakout boxes, how many people have experienced the breakout boxes? This is the mini pitch that we have these available at the sites. There's two of them at each site. And um, what I love about the breakout box is James Sanders is a friend of mine, the guy who invented it. It's like the pet rock of education. Here's a box with five locks on it, and you get to do anything you want with it. And people are just like, it's amazing. And the, really, the only amazing thing about it is it asks kids to be in charge of problem solving and thinking through a set of problems. And then as a teacher, you facilitate that by asking them questions. And so these five locks can be related to any content area in the world based on the questions that you ask as a teacher, which is pretty amazing, right? And that's the other side of this for me is technology offers a tool set that allows us to explore, but then there's this other part that is anchored in just what is human? And it's still we're all humans still, right? And so there's this real human element to it, and that's why the breakout thing uh, is pretty exciting, actually. All right, so next slide. <clears throat> all right, so on the piece in the middle, there, there are two frameworks that I want to offer as a way to think through this. Uh, they're worth exploring. Like, I've, I've come back to them as my own anchor in ways to check my own thinking. Uh, one time I was working on an iMovie project, and I'd worked on it for hours, and my friend came by just, like, literally like this. Hey, that looks good. Is that for the kids, or is that for you? And after he walked, he just kept walking. I was like, oh, my God, that was totally for me. I just spent all those hours working on something that had nothing to do with the kids. Uh, so it's useful to be grounded in, like, back to these ideas. Uh, uh, so we have two frameworks that we want to give to you or provide as a way to think about this. One is four C's, and it's actually included in Perl. So this has um, been very popular over the last few years. They call it the four C's of 21st century learning because, you know, 17 years into the 21st century, we still want to make sure we know which century we're in. It's the 21st century. I'm switching over to the modern age. That's my new phrase. <laughs> Watch. So I, modern age. 21st century is going away. Modern age. Beaverson said it here. Whatever the day is today, I'm telling you now. Modern age. But anyway, four C's of 21st century learning. So what are those four C's? Those four C's are kids. Uh, oh, yeah. Hit it again. It's a, little, it's a little awkward. All right. So the four C's are, has anybody already experienced the four C's? This is four C's. Good. All right. So what are the four C's? Why don't you guys tell me? You, what, will you hit up until they all show up? Oh, wait. Sorry. That doesn't work because I'm asking them. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so what are the four C's? Anybody? Creativity. Creativity. Very, very good. Very good. Collaboration. Collaboration. That's another one. Good? Communication. Communication. That is another one? Critical thinking. And critical thinking. All right. All right. So you can show all four of those now. So creativity, communication, collaboration, and critical thinking are being offered as the essential skills for the 21st century. Imagine this amazing time in the future called the 21st century. And these essential skills, creativity, communication, collaboration, and critical thinking. Uh, so what I um, 
experience with these things to me is like uh, those don't feel particularly unique to the 21st century. Those are actually just human traits, right? We need to be creative. We need to be able to communicate. We're better when we can collaborate. Uh, and then critical thinking is an essential element of being a thoughtful human being. And so there's actually those in and of themselves in isolation are not unique to the 21st century. What is unique to the 21st century is our ability to connect with other people. And the way that now when you can share your creativity, uh, just e even in our situation, because we're all secondary, it is literally a three-click switch to take a private document that you've been working on and typing on and to publish that for the entire world to have access to. right? And so the ability to create and be creative uh, and to share it with other people is dramatically increased. Um, you can, for a less than $500, set yourself up with a camera, a place to broadcast your television program, and create an audience. And that's like this real democratic thing, which is um, pretty unique. Uh, and so really, the four C's are fundamental human things. And I think we ground ourselves in what is important as humans, what has changed is our access and the tools that we have. Um, throughout that. And then as I was thinking deeper about this as far as planning goes, like what does that look like in a classroom in a real practical sense? To me, if you hit it, if you hit boop again, I, I'm hoping that this is there. To me, this actually climbs from individual to the collective. And so I've actually organized these on purpose to say that um, if you think about as you're doing your work, what it looks like in the classroom, I would make a case that every kid should have a moment in your classroom to be creative on their own. So the quiet, quick write that they do, or the math problem that they solve, or the notation that they figure out, or whatever it is, every kid should have a moment to be creative on their own. And that's their private time, uh, locked away in their own brain to have their own thoughts. And then they need to be able to communicate that. And the more effective they are at communicating that, it can lead to this collaboration where now we're creating knowledge together, which is another one of the things that's actually very different about the, goal, the modern age that we live in, is that we can create information together in ways that just weren't possible before. And then as anyone, I mean, it doesn't matter where you land in the political spectrum, as anyone who's paid any attention over the last year knows, like this critical thinking element is essential. And so we can model that in our class every single day where kids have a moment to be creative, where they take time to communicate that creativity, where they work together to make it better, and then they think critically about what's being shared with them. And every single day that that can happen. And that might be 15 minutes, right? You just kick off the beginning of class, 15 minutes. These are standards that we can get behind because they're like human standards. So that's the four C's. That's a way to think about uh, your work as you're going forward. You won't always get to all four of those, but it's just an idea. So then next. Uh, when in doubt, ask the kids. Um, I've been working on this constructivist thing for quite a while, and I have this amazing opportunity now that I work uh, back at a high school site to test this theory regularly. Like, if I put the problem to the kids, will they come up with a solution? And sometimes they'll be like, I want the solution, and then, you know, the life's more wonderful over here, and they get really distracted and don't come up with the answer. But every now and then, and regularly, uh, if I ask them the question, they actually follow through and come up with the solution. So we just ask the kids repeatedly, um, and that uh, seems to work out pretty good. Next. <laughs> this is uh, daunting, and I've tried to find the updated version of this because this was 14 years ago. But you know, functionally, every two days, we're creating as much information as had been created by humanity up until those two days. And it's more than that now. Like a lot more. So what does that mean? Go on beyond that to the next slide. So that means some crazy things. Uh, the learning has been liberated. Everybody can learn now, and that information has been unbound. No longer is there some uh, discrete person who holds the knowledge. Knowledge is there, available for everybody. Go on to the next. Um, just kids, you know, like focus on the child, and all else follows. Like we'll just put the kids up again. Next. Um, there's a shift in thinking that has to do with literacy, too. And all I want to do is just because of my language arts background, I have to share this with you. And you can keep clicking through. 
uh, because I just want to glance across this, that there was a, the concept of literacy was that um, there was a very individual relationship with the book, uh, that the book was very author-centric, and because it was a printed material that it was fixed. And that has changed also dramatically, that uh, actually now content is collaborative, uh, that the author is very often asking people to participate in with that with them, and that it's no longer fixed, but it's actually a dynamic relationship with information. Uh, and so that, that is a different way to be literate, which would suggest that we as um, adults might actually be less literate today than we were when we graduated from high school. If we're not able to uh, understand and create in this new medium, this realm that is going on, that we might, we might actually be less literate, right? The greatest example of, the, of um, what dynamic literacy looks like now and what this stuff looks like is look at a YouTube page and the video is just a portion of the content and the actual website is dynamic and created regularly by the comment feedback that goes on the bottom. So if you have author as the person who created the video, the actual content of the site changes based on the comments that are included in it. And so it's growing. It's dynamic. It's not fixed. It's not done. I created a video there. You watch it. I don't care whether you liked it or not. Now you can actually give feedback, some of it um, a little bit more uh, poisonous than others. <clears throat> All right, so that's my glancing blow at literacy, just something to think about. Technology is anything that wasn't around when you were born. I love to hold on to this idea as well. Uh, like, you know, it's, I guess it's just going to be anachronistic for a long time that we call our little tiny computing devices in our pockets phones. Just last night as I was taking another picture with it, I was like, you might as well call this a camera because I very rarely call anybody on it. Like, it's just a never, but so, uh, you know, that's that weird thing in my brain. All right, <clears throat> continuing on. Hit play. This is the fear of technology before we start off this project. Is it any wonder people are afraid of technology? Technology! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> It is a rapidly changing world, and like when I say the YouTube page, you can watch from my perspective. I can see some people be like, oh, yeah, I love YouTube, and then other people be like, oh, that comment section is bleh. Like, I get it. Um, it can be overwhelming considering the pace of change of technology. Um, but then we go into this way to just think about your own skills in technology. You can go one more. Uh, which is a, a simple little framework, a way for you to think about your work through the summertime um, as your own growth model. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to describe this growth model. SAMR is one. It has four letters. I go with RAT because it has three letters, and so it gets there faster. It's also out of the, the University of Minnesota, so I appreciate its localness. SAMR is some guy at some other place. I don't, I don't actually track it. No, because I've been on RAT for so long. I think he works in the Midwest. He seems like a nice guy, but then I heard maybe he wasn't a nice guy. The two women that did the rat thing, really upstanding people, so I really like them a lot. So here's a way, as you're doing your work this summertime, to look at and reflect on your own growth. Because some of you are tech ninjas already, like you're ready to go, I'm looking at the room. Some of you are, you've got it. And this is good time for you to dive even deeper. Some of you are still like uh, being dragged along to this technology line. Um, it's not the table directly to my left at all. Um, but there, it, that goes on, right? And everybody can put themselves. I said it's not. Uh, so RAD is a way to think about this. Um, the R stands for replacement. I have no idea how this is going to show up. I can't remember. Oh, yeah. So replacement. And then the A is amplification. And the T is transformation. And again, it's just a way to anchor and think about your own work. So here's how I describe it. The replacement is squarely focused on the tool. So the, the easiest example for replacement for me, particularly in this district, is over the last four years. Uh, four years ago, you were limited to, could only use Microsoft Word for your word processing. Maybe it was five years ago now. But that was it. If you want to do word processing, you had one choice, and it was Microsoft Word. Now, this other thing came along. It's called Google Docs. Google Docs is a word processor. When you stop using Word or when you use Google Docs instead of Word, you've simply replaced one technology for another. Replacement, boom, straight, forward. It's just I'm working over here now because I like the way it looks. 
fine, no big deal. It's all about the tools. Amplification is um, a little bit more on the teacher practice. So this is when you become, become comfortable with a set of tools and its enhanced capabilities, then you as a teacher start to make decisions based on that enhanced capability. So the real bread and butter of Google Docs has always been the fact that it can be collaborative. That was the thing. Forget about all of the other stuff that it could do. The one thing that made it compelling enough for a language arts teacher to use it when it was nothing but a blank page and you literally had to wait seconds to see what someone else was typing was the idea that someone else could actually type on it, right? Collaboration, being able to work together to create knowledge and content is amplified. That's, that's, a, that's something that you couldn't do before, that you can do now. And so now as a teacher, you're making decisions based on that capability. And then the T for transformation is squarely focused on the student. And uh, the way that I've always described this that seems to work is transformation is the most difficult to describe, but the easiest to recognize. Because you know you've created something transformational when a student surprises you. When they give you something and you're like, I never would have thought of doing it that way, but that makes total sense to me. Then you've created an opportunity open enough for them to surprise you, right? And that's transformation. So that's that little framework. Um, you will, uh, in some cases, you're going to stick on this replacement thing because it's awesome sauce and it took care of your need and you just replaced one technology for a new one and it works for you and you're never going to move. That's fine. Then other situations are going to be around here amplifying, trying to figure out how do I change that lesson, how do I change that presentation so that I can get the kids more involved with it. Uh, not every single time and not every single instance are you going to be looking to climb all the way up to transformation, uh, but you will at various times find yourself on that scale. OK, that's good. Totally lost track of time. That's a fun little thing I'll tell you about some other time. It's a secret. We'll meet in July. I'll tell you in July. Um, this quote to me has been uh, pretty remarkable. It's the reason why I believe in the cohort model. It's the reason why I'm excited. It's the reason why I'm optimistic. It's the reason why I think we actually live in a really wonderful time, even though there's all this negative noise going on. Actually, it's amazing. In the last 30 years, the best stuff has just been set up to be invented for the future. We don't even know yet what we get to do, but we have been provided a democratic set of tools that's rather remarkable. And in this district, where all the kids are one-to-one, -one, have access to the web, and have access to the same tools that you do, what gets invented, the ways that we help kids go deeper, take their knowledge further, do something with that knowledge, is really very exciting. And you are the group, the early adopters, you're the groups that really get to decide who that is. And no matter where you are in your ease and comfort with using technology, the one thing to remember is, as a generation, we are the early adopters. We're the first group of educators to work through this, right? Like no else in history have, have had this set of tools and this type of connectivity um, before we did. And so that's, to me, also very exciting. And so I think it's a rather exciting time. And then my last slide is a picture of my kids. Um, I don't have all of those kids. Only two of them are mine. <clears throat> um, but it's this idea that um, what I love about teaching, what I love about education, and what I love about public schools, I mentioned in the beginning, is this idea of all. Can we reach all children? I don't know. It's an aspirational goal. But what I do know is this. If we're going to get closer to that goal, it will require new methods and new manners. Because if we could have done it, we already would have. It will, it's necessary for us to invent new ways to do it. Well, we have more tools to do that invention than ever before. So we set you off with 20 hours over the summertime for you as practitioners, professionals, people who have spent 80% of your life thinking about considering other people's learning to dive in and go deep. And that's to us really what the summer cohort's about. And that's why it's exciting for us. We, it's great to hear back what you've done uh, starting in the school year. And we'll take some time to share those things too as well. So that's a little framework. I know I wandered off and went probably about seven minutes longer than I was supposed to. but. Um, but I appreciate the time, and we will come back to those concepts uh, throughout the summer and through the next school year as well. So thanks a lot.